Okay, cell biology fans, we're going to finish up this lecture on protein structure, what we didn't get to in class. At this point, you should have a firm grasp on amino acids, and you should be learning the 20 side chains of the amino acids. And now we're going to start talking about how the overall structure of proteins is formed, because that really matters to understand what the function is. So we already looked at this image. This image is showing you a string of amino acids, and the backbone is shown in white. The white is the NCC, 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 and the green and blue that are sticking out are the side chains, or the R groups. And some of the R groups are polar, some of the R groups are nonpolar, and that ultimately leads to a folded conformation that you see on the right-hand side. And in general, you will see that hydrophobic amino acids get buried inside of a protein, and I'm just saying this is a generality. Not all hydrophobic amino acids will end up on the inside. Some will inevitably end up on the outside, but think of this in generalities. The overall number is going to be higher when they're hidden than when they're not. And the polar side chains want to stick out, and that's also true. You have some polar on the inside, but the vast majority of them are on the outside, and, and they want to make covalent, uh, non-covalent bonds, mostly hydrogen bonding, you'll see. makes a big difference. So that's going to be really important in understanding how this protein structure develops. Now, there are other things that affect protein structure, and there are tons and tons of tons of something called modifications. Modifications to amino acids can change their structure. We've talked about one, we've talked about phosphorylation, but you can have acetyl groups added, methyl groups added, so methyl groups are CH3s, um, and all of these changes to specific amino acids will change the structure, and it changes how the amino acids can interact with one another in any amino acid chain. So when we make these modifications, whether they're there from the beginning or whether they're added dynamically throughout the lifetime of a protein, changes the function of that protein as these modifications are, are made. So if you add things, there's going to change. If you remove these modifications, it also changes the structure. And you can see there's lots of modifications that occur. Phosphates, acetyl groups, sumo groups, ubiquitin, um, I believe if I shrink this down, the methyl is shown there. And so all of these are modifications to specific amino acids. Now, we talked about um, the different kinds of bonds. You can have covalent bonds, and covalent bonds are formed by the sharing of electrons versus non-covalent bonds. And just as a reminder, here are the four types of non-covalent bonds that we know of. There's ionic bonding, right? And ionic bonding has to do with the giving up of an electron and the um, acceptance of an electron, so you end up with ions. And the classic example of that is the molecule water, uh, not water, salt, right? And that's one type of bond, and all bonds store energy, regardless of whether it's an ionic bond or a covalent bond. Hydrogen bonding, all right. Make sure you understand that. That's because you have a partially positive uh, charge on, sorry, partially positive charge on this hydrogen because over here you have a partially negative charge on the, on the nitrogen because it's electronegative. That creates the ability of the partially negative charge that's associated with this oxygen. So the negative and positive attract one another through what's called a hydrogen bond. Those are really important in the structure of proteins. The third is van der Waals forces. So van der Waals forces has to do with how close two atoms can be to one another. There's an optimum value, an optimal attraction between two atoms. If you're too close together, right, so if you're too close, there's a repulsion, right? That's the getting in somebody's personal space. If you get too close to somebody, they really do want to push you away. Same thing with atoms. And if you're too far apart, right, out here, you're not going to be able to interact with somebody. So atoms also have that same capacity. And the last one is hydrophobic force, and that's demonstrated in this image by the separation of oil from water. Even though this portion 
of the oil is still in contact with water, somebody's got to do it. But the vast majority of the oil molecules, the, the hydrocarbon chains, are separated from water, and that, that allows for particular formations of proteins to occur as well. Now, there are four levels of structure for proteins, and very cleverly they're called primary, down here, so primary is designated by one with a degree, secondary, whoops, secondary is two with a degree, tertiary and quaternary. And they're going to form from a string of amino acids. So the primary structure is just the string of amino acids, but when you get to the end, what you actually have is a very complex structure that is regulated based on these four levels of protein folding. We're going to talk about this and what uh, determines each level of protein folding. Here are just some examples of proteins that are folded. And I put this specific example in because this is the protein that I worked on for my dissertation. It's called C-reactive protein, CRP which I suppose if you were to say that, it's crap. I didn't realize that for seven and a half years. And how is that possible, knowing what I, where my mind goes? Is, it's baffling to me. But what's really interesting about this protein is that it's made up of five identical subunits. So you have five subunits, and each of those is called, okay, the protein that may, is made is CRP. But the overall functional molecule of CRP Okay, so let's make red be the functional protein. It doesn't exist unless you have five of these individual CRP molecules. And then on top of that, they actually have to be arranged in a particular structure for the functionality of CRP to occur. That particular structure shown in the space filling model in C um, I hope what you get, it, it looks a little bit like a donut. And this donut has two sides. Think of it as being 3D, and a 2D image of this, it's hard to imagine, but this is actually just like a donut. And you could imagine that if this is a protein and it has to interact with other proteins or, or DNA or whatever, that right the top part is going to interact with something. And then if you flip the donut over, it actually is going to have a totally different function on that side. And, and that the donut could link two different things together by having two functionalities on the different sides. And that's exactly what I learned in my dissertation. I was looking at the functionality of one side of the protein. These are additional um, examples of structures of proteins that have resulted due to the folding, the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures of proteins. And I hope you can tell from, okay, from over here, the one that's on the left top, it sort of doesn't really look like much of a structure at all. In this, it's hard to tell in a ribbon diagram, so this is a ribbon diagram compared to the space filling model which is shown on the bottom right um, what the overall structure but the ribbon diagram is probably just this sort of blob looking protein whereas the space filling model on the different protein on the bottom right okay so that protein looks like an L right it's got the shape of an L and you could imagine that there could be functionality out on one end in the blue group there could be functionality at the very furthest end by the red group and you could have different functions for yellow and green and even the white parts so depending on how a protein folds you get these uh, regions that could have completely different functions and all of that is based on understanding how the primary secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures are made. We've already talked about what the primary structure is. The primary structure is the NCC, 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 the backbone, and the R groups. Okay, so on the top here of this image, the R groups are sticking out in green, and I'm circling them, and the NCC is this backbone that is the sequence of amino acids that are linked together through peptide bonds. So that is what we call the primary structure, the sequence of amino acids. 
Secondary structure is something that occurs, and I'm going to talk about it in just one moment, and you can get structures that look like what's shown here, and this is called an alpha helix. Think of it as a spiral staircase. All right, And then the secondary structure folds up again and into something. So in the bottom right here, what you see are a whole bunch of alpha helices. So I can count one alpha helices, two, three, four, five, six. I don't know if you would count that little thing as seven, eight. Eight alpha helices that now have folded together into a particular structure. And that is the tertiary structure. So let's begin by talking about the secondary structures. And I said that an alpha helix was one of them. And I'm going to tell you lots of things about it on this slide, and I'm not going to ask you to remember very many of them. It's a right-handed helix. What the hell does that mean? Stick out your right hand, and your thumb right, is up. And so what that means is that it turns going to the right. If you don't understand what I just said, that's perfectly fine. Let it go. Uh, the next thing, 3.6 residues per turn. Uh, next thing, 5.4 angstroms per turn. 1.5 angstrom per residue. None of that do you have to remember. Okay, those are numbers. And it's what's interesting is, you know, somewhere along the lines, 3.6 angstroms per turn actually made sense to me. And when you look at what the alpha helix and how it's formed, that will make more sense to you. The thing you do need to know is that alpha helices form due to hydrogen bonding between backbone carbonyls and the uh, extra hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen that is found on the nitrogen, and that's because you get the hydrogen bond due to partially negative and partially positive charges due to electronegative atoms, oxygen, and nitrogen. All right. What does that mean? Well, don't worry about it if you don't understand it. Let's look at the images and hope that you get it from that. The second secondary structure, so a secondary structure can also be, instead of an alpha helix, something called a beta pleated sheet. And all this means is that you have a string of amino acids going in one direction and a string of amino acids next to it and that you get hydrogen bonding between the partially positive charges that are on nitrogens and the partially negative charges so I'm going to circle the partially negative charges on oxygens right? so the oxygens stick out and the nitrogens shown here are just the blue links and and circled in red. Well, that's confusing. But this all forms because of the same reason. You get hydrogen bonding between the backbone carbonyl and hydrogen that's bound to the backbone nitrogen. So secondary structure is due to hydrogen bonding from the backbone. And that's versus what you're going to see. It doesn't result due to the R groups. Okay, Remember you have R groups that are going to stick off of each amino acid. The secondary structure has nothing to do with the R groups. Okay. Here's some more images of proteins and these are showing you um, in the top left you see something called a beta sandwich. That means it's taken some strings of, right, so you have strings of amino acids that are bound together through hydrogen bonding and a sandwich is basically like you have a piece of bread on top okay so I'm going to draw the first piece of bread that's on top in red okay and then you actually have a second piece of bread that's on the bottom and I don't know if I'm going to be able to draw this very well but it's beta sheets that sit on top of one another so that's called a beta sandwich Probably more understandable is something called a beta barrel, which is shown in the bottom right. They're showing you a side view on the left, so this is the side view, and then this is a top-down view on the right. And the beta barrel just takes beta 
pleated sheets that are bound together through hydrogen bonding, right? There's all sorts of hydrogen bonding from one uh, beta strand to another, and they're linked together, and they create this, this particular structure. And what's really interesting about this is this sticks in membranes. This is often found in membranes, and it's a protein called a porin. So what do porins make? Porins make pores, and they stick through membranes. So this also has another interesting feature to it. Uh, beta barrels are big enough that there's amino acids that stick into the middle off of these uh, beta pleated sheets, but there's also amino acids that stick out from this. And remember, if, if this is in a membrane, if this is bound in a membrane, the amino acids that stick out on the sides from the beta barrel are going to be interacting with the uh, phospholipid bilayer, th usually through hydrophobic force. Whereas the proteins that are sticking into the middle, these often make aqueous channels through, pr through cells, and so they are usually polar amino acids that like to interact with that aqueous environment. So proteins can be complex. Proteins can have structure. Proteins can bind to one another. And on top of that, we know that you can get specific regions within a protein that form into different functional groups. And I don't actually like this image that well because um, they're showing you proteins that have specific functional regions in them, but it almost looks, if you look at this one on the top for EGF, right, the, the green hexagon looks like it's sitting on top of the amino acid chains. And notice the amino acid chains are also wrong. This should be NH3 plus and COO minus. So there's multiple reasons I don't like this. So even though they're depicting it like this is a green thing sitting on top of the amino acid chain, it's actually the EGF domain, so this is a domain that we can recognize. It's part of the amino acid sequence, just like I took that, that um, wire and I folded it into right, three folds within the wire. That fold in the wire could be an EGF domain, it could be a chymotrypsin domain, it could be a urokinase domain. Which one's urokinase? The blue one. It could be a factor IX domain. Right. And what happens is that over over the course of time, we've been able to identify many, many of these uh, functional domains that are part of protein sequences. And this, I love this image, because each one of these is a functional domain. And so, you know, you're never going to know all of these functional domains. You might learn some of them if you work for work in science long enough. Uh, we are going to talk about several of these. You're going to see we're going to talk about SH3 domains. We're going to talk about SH2 domains. Uh, we might talk about five domains. Uh, there's my SH2 domain. We talk about PTB domains. Anything else that I can think of? Uh, my lab works on ANC domains. I know a lot about CARD domains. Um... Uh, blah blah blah. Some of these I don't even know what they are, but each one of these is basically a fold, folded up part of a protein that has a function. So the structure, right, really is important and it leads to function. How did this come about? Well, it's, it's really cool because over evolutionary time, Right? The very simplest of organisms probably have very simple protein structures. You know, each particular protein might have had one function. But we can see that over time, and there, this is just looking at one protein, so here it is looking at this particular protein in yeast, and in worms, and in humans, and so evolution, we are the furthest down on the evolutionary tree. And what you see is that the core structure of the protein has remained the same. Right? You can see that this core structure has remained the same, but there's been additions to the protein over time. And this, it doesn't always mean that the core structure remains the same. It could be that the core structure is expanded upon. Right? You could have things added in to different places on the core structure. But 
what happens is that proteins have gained these functional domains usually through uh, manipulations in the genetic code. So mutations or crossovers in the chromosomes cause these additional uh, structures to be added to proteins and it all starts in the DNA. So I wanted to finish this little talk up by talking to you about how this works with respect to multiple domains in a protein and how they actually function together. They communicate with one another and that communication leads to specific functions. So you might have different domains within a protein that have completely opposite functions but one depends on the other like a string of dominoes. So the protein that we're going to talk about is this particular domain, this particular protein here which is just, this is depicting a string of amino acids and within, notice this should be an NH3 and this should be a CO minus, boy that just bugs me, but what you should see is that there are these three different domains. One of them is, right, so this would be a loop in my in my structure, so we would have three loops in my wire that I had. Um, the number of amino acids in each domain is different. The structure will be different. The sequence of amino acids is going to be different. And each of these has a different function. We know that SH3 domains, so this domain allows this protein to bind to regions that are called polyproline regions. Proline was the amino acid, I don't know if you remember because, you know, it was maybe two days ago, that has a particular structure. Oops, sorry. So proline has the structure that causes the any sequence of amino acids to have a kink in it because this bond is no longer, it cannot rotate freely because of the amino, amino group. And so this polyproline region is going to have a particular structure which is recognized by SH3 domains. SH2 domains, on the other hand, this SH2 domain binds to regions that have phosphorylated tyrosine residues. I don't know if you remember tyrosine. The one letter symbol for tyrosine is Y. Its three letter symbol is this. Its R group is very similar to uh, phenylalanine but it has this hydroxyl group on the end which can be phosphorylated and in a particular sequence all right, of amino acids, phosphorylated tyrosine residues are bound by SH2 domains. And finally, the last domain that's shown here is going to be this kinase domain. And the kinase domain, a kinase is the enzyme that allows another, uh, the phosphorylation of proteins. So this adds phosphate groups, either to serines or threonines, or to tyrosines. Do you remember why all of these can get phosphorylated? Because they all have the hydroxyl group at the end. Okay. Kinase domains can also phosphorylate lipids because lipids also contain hydroxyl groups. So taken together, if you look at this, right, so this is showing you the same exact protein that was on that previous page. You have the SH3 domain here. You next have the SH2 domain. The SH3 wants to bind polyprolines. This one wants to bind to uh, phosphorylated tyrosines. And the kinase domain wants to actually do the phosphorylating. And it could either phosphorylate itself or it could phosphorylate other proteins. Well, when this particular protein, and this is just an example of how this could work, this particular protein is made. It has right here it actually has a phosphorylated tyrosine in the sequence of amino acids of the protein that binds the SH2 domain. Now, it, what that does is it creates a particular structure of this protein. If an enzyme were to come along and remove that phosphate, what enzyme removes phosphates? It's called a phosphatase. So 
Well, if an en enzyme comes and removes that phosphate, well, now that blue right, region is allowed to float freely away from that original phosphorylated tyrosine. So you still have the tyrosine. Here's the tyrosine, but it's no longer phosphorylated. Okay, well, every time proteins move and change, those effects can be on other regions within the protein. So what this next picture shows is that this SH2 domain is no longer binding to uh, the original phosphorylated tyrosine. And it actually then ends up finding a phosphorylated tyrosine in another protein. So you have something called an activating ligand. And it's interesting because it's activating. It didn't begin this whole process. You actually had to have a phosphatase to remove the original phosphate group. But it's an activating ligand because when this particular protein binds to this uh, SH2 domain, it also has a region that binds to the SH3 domain. So this region in the green protein is a polyproline region. And that's bound by this SH3 domain shown here in the image. What does all of this binding of these proteins do? Well, it activates something. Guess what it activates? The binding of the activating ligand actually causes a change in the conformation of the protein around the kinase domain. And this loop here is pushed out of the way and, okay, you actually end up with this, uh, this tyrosine here. I think it's a tyrosine. It could be a serine or a threonine. I'm not sure. Okay, gets phosphorylated by the kinase, and that pushes it out of the way. And now you have this highly active kinase domain that can phosphorylate itself or other proteins. And this is really the way that a lot of proteins work. They, they get activated either by a kinase or a phosphatase. So, you, so you're changing the structure of a protein, you're changing its function. That allows for interaction with additional molecules, additional proteins, additional lipids, nucleotides. It doesn't matter. That changes the structure of the protein and that once again changes the function. So it's like a light switch where you can turn it on and you can turn it off. All of this can be turned off by re-phosphorylating that original phosphate group that would then bind back to the SH2 domain. And why would it bind back? Because it has a higher affinity for that SH2 domain than the uh, phosphorylated tyrosine in the green protein. So this is really what you're going to begin to understand when we're talking about proteins. They're going to bind to one another. I'm not just joking around. I am joking around when I say, okay, what happens if I sit on your lap? Clearly that's going to change your structure. It's going to change your function. It's going to break your leg, okay, because I'm big. Well, proteins do this too, and they change the structure of other proteins that they interact with. And why does protein structure matter? Lots and lots and lots of reasons, okay. Two things that you want to be able to say, so you regulating activity, so you can both temporally, so in time, you can turn things on and off, but also in a particular space, okay, you can temporally and spatially activate proteins when and where you want them to act. So it, it only functions, right, to regulate activity if you have right, the right proteins in the right place. If they're not in the right place, if you're in the wrong place at the right time, that doesn't work. If in your right place in the wrong time, that doesn't work. You have to be in the right place at the right time. Same thing happens with proteins to get the proper functioning of proteins. And specificity of activity, right, you want the proteins that we're activating to work on the correct substrates and that all depends on the structure of the protein. So what causes changes in structure? Lots and lots and lots of things. Modifications we already talked about. All right. Changes in binding. Changes in conformation to proteins change the structure, 
and change the function. That's going to be it for today. Very short, very much to the point. We'll have a quiz on Monday about all the things that you're supposed to be doing with your proteins. This lecture should help you with our analysis of proteins because we're going to start looking at protein domains within the uh, genes and the protein products of those genes in class. Have a great weekend.